Hi everyone. I'm here in Chapter 5 of the Course Packet, which is about quantifying uncertainty in statistical models using a particular technique that we'll learn called the bootstrap. And as a way of motivating this topic, this idea of quantifying the uncertainty about our, our parameters in a statistical model, uh, I draw your attention to this quote right here uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine about 10 years ago. It's talking about the results of a clinical trial of following two groups of patients over four years. 250 uh, cancer patients were given a new chemotherapy drug, and 253 patients were given the previous standard of care, the control of surgery alone. Uh, and the question was, what were their survival rates after four years? And it turns out that 36% uh, of the patients survived in the chemotherapy group, and 23% of the patients survived in the control group, which is, uh, had surgery alone. And if uh, you know that's a binary variable, treatment versus control, and a binary outcome, survive versus die, the standard way to, to calculate some kind of association between those two would be a relative risk. So if you calculate the relative risk of survival, it's 36 over 23. Uh, that's about 1.6. Uh, and the natural question here is 1.6 plus or minus what? If we'd had different subjects in this trial, you know, a different group of 250 patients in the chemotherapy group, a different group of 253 patients in the control group, would we have gotten a different answer other than 1.6? You betcha, right? Different di patients mean different data set, mean a different answer for our estimates of the effect. Uh, and, and we have to have our, uh, a handle on some way of quantifying the scale of this variation over here, of this uncertainty. Uh, could it have been as large as 1.9? Could it have been as small as 1.0, which would indicate no effect whatsoever, no difference between the treatment groups? Uh, in light of what's presented here, we just don't know, and we have to have some way of getting a handle on uh, all of this uncertainty. Okay, uh, so uh, the key idea uh, in characterizing uncertainty in statistical models is that of a sampling distribution. Uh, this is a subtle idea. Uh, it takes a while to unpack because it involves a somewhat non-intuitive thought experiment. Uh, and so, you know, we're going to take the next several minutes and just kind of go step by step through the construction of a sampling distribution, both in theory as well as in practice, using this technique of bootstrapping. Now, the key principle uh, that underlies all of this behind the use of sampling distributions to quantify uncertainty uh, is this equivalence that I've written right here. The idea that we can be confident in our estimates if and only if those estimates are stable under the influence of chance. On the other hand, if our estimates wildly vary uh, under one kind of random data set to another, then we cannot be confident in our estimates. Uh, you know, if the story keeps changing, in other words, there is a little basis for trusting your particular estimates. So, uh, you know, a natural question here would be, well, why would the story change? Why would our estimates be unstable under the influence of chance? Uh, well, one obvious source of instability in our estimates is when the observations in our data set are themselves subject to random forces. So I'm going to zoom in on this picture over here. Uh, which shows uh, something familiar. It's graduating GPA here on the uh, on the y-axis, uh, and it is a combined SAT score here on the x-axis. We can see a nice uh, straight line fit to the data. Uh, and the question is, well, what if uh, the random forces that influence GPA and SAT score had been a little bit different? I mean, think to your own experience of taking the SAT. If you'd had slightly different questions that day, or, you know, again, for uh, for the GPA, you know, if you'd had a slightly better breakfast on the morning of your chemistry final, your particular GPA and SAT score would have been slightly different. The same is true for all 5,000 of the people in the scatter plot, and we would have gotten a very slightly different line. The obvious question is, how different could it have been? That's giving us an, uh, some notion of how much we can trust this particular line that we got for this particular data set. Okay. So uh, it helps to have some kind of concrete example to think through this. And so I'll use the, uh, the analogy of a fishing trip here. Okay, so uh, you've got to imagine going fishing on four successive days. And, and you go fishing to some lake, and, and you know every one of these little gray dots in the background, I'm kind of picking out a few right here, every one of those gray dots is a fish. That's the whole population of fish in the lake. Let me erase these dots. So... What do you do? Uh, you go out, uh, you know, have a nice long four-day weekend to go fishing, uh, you know, at your at your cabin out in the woods. Uh, and on day one, uh, you know, Friday of your long weekend, you go out and you catch 15 fish. And because you're in a statistics class and you're kind of in stats dork mode, you decide you're going to do a little bit of regression analysis with your fish. So you calculate the weight of all these fish and the volume of all these fish, and you run a regression line. 
So on the uh, on the, I mean, what could be more obvious on a fishing trip, right? So uh, the first day uh, that you catch 15 fish, let's say you get these blue dots right here. You know, there's a blue dot, there's a blue dot, you know, there's another blue dot in there. And, and you know, what do you calculate as the least squares regression line for your particular sample of 15 fish, those 15 blue ones right there? You get this line right there. Okay, simple enough. That's your least squares fit. So now, let me erase the, all this stuff right here. Uh, now you go back on day two. It's Saturday of your fishing trip. So you had a nice good uh, Friday fishing. You come out and you now you start catching another group of 15 fish. And, and this time it's the redfish. And here's some redfish over here, some redfish over here. Uh, and for this particular sample of 15 fish, you get this line right here, the red line. And you can see the red line here and the blue line here are different lines. That reflects sampling variability. Uh, and you can kind of see where this is going right here. You go out again on, a, on the third day, and you catch these light blue fish right here and here, and you get this light blue line, you know, and comparing that light blue line on day three to these kind of yellow-green line on day four to the day two line, the day one line. You're getting four different lines here reflecting variability from one sample of size 15 uh, to another sample of size 15. All right. This is giving you some idea of this concept of a sampling distribution. Um, it's a little bit loose because there's only four different days right here. Uh, so let's actually page over to the computer version of this. This is now a really long fishing trip. We've taken a fishing trip of, simulated in the computer of 2,500 days. So it's, a, it's a lot of fish. Uh, and each one of these tiny, uh, thin, little uh, gray lines, you know, here's one, here's one. There's like a, a whole bunch in there, right? Every single one of those lines represents the least squares line that you fit to one particular sample of 15 fish on one particular day. Uh, and the scale of this fan, you can see this fan is kind of narrower in here and a lot wider out here. That visually is a depiction of the sampling distribution of the least squares estimator. You can just see that area, it, that's your zone of uncertainty right there. On the basis of a sample of size 15, that's about how well your sample can narrow, can narrow down the true line. Uh, and if you, if you actually were to go back and catch every fish in the lake and, and uh, do the population line, it's this red line in the middle. It's kind of hard to see when I draw it there, but it's that line right there. You can see the red dotted line. Uh, so uh, you, you can see that the, tr the estimates are centered around the truth, but with a lot of variability. Uh, and this is getting at the idea of a sampling distribution. Okay, so let's, let's now step back and say, all right, what have we done here? Uh, we need kind of some schematic uh, to uh, to formalize this idea because here you know we've got a whole line and, and uh, it's a little bit harder to visualize uh, so let's let's move to this picture over here this schematic represents what we're doing so let's pretend that up here in the population we've got some parameter that we're trying to estimate and we're going to keep this parameter very generic we're going to let it uh, be denoted by the Greek letter theta right here so uh, you know if you want to think in more concrete terms maybe theta is the population mean uh, of you know the fish in the lake or theta could be it could be beta 1 it could be the true slope of the line for all uh, you know thousand fish in the lake all right so that's what we're trying to estimate right here uh, we don't have the whole population we only have a sample so let's imagine taking one sample over here. This is sample one. Uh, and you know how big is that sample? Maybe it's 15, maybe it's 100, however big it is. From that sample, we calculate our estimate. So maybe that's the sample mean. We call that theta hat, and you notice the superscript one uh, denotes the fact that it comes from sample one. So you know if you want to think concretely in terms of the least squares estimator, uh, theta might be the true slope up here. And theta hat 1 might be the estimated slope down here. But of course, this cartoon is completely generic. Uh, it you know, might be the true mean and the, uh, the estimated mean. Sorry, my, my handwriting on the, uh, on the iPad is pretty terrible right here. Let's, let's erase that. All right, so that's one particular sample. Now you do it again. You go to sample 2, and you calculate your estimate from sample 2. That's theta hat 2. And you do it again and again and again and again, over and over again. You get out here to a sample 1,000, and you've got theta hat 1,000. Uh, and, you know, the, this dot, dot, dot here is indicating that, you know, in theory here you keep going, but 1,000 is enough to get the idea. Uh, and if you now take all 1,000 of these theta hats down here, the estimate from sample 1, the estimate from sample 2, and you pull them all and you make a histogram, you know, I'll kind of draw a little curve here to represent this distribution. That histogram is now called the sampling distribution of our estimator. Right, and the estimator is whatever procedure we use to construct the estimate in this sample, and this sample, and in this sample over here. 
All right, so this sampling distribution is the object that we want to get our hands on, and it involves this thought experiment. What if I were repeatedly taking one sample after another, and for each sample, reconstructing my estimator on the basis of that sample alone? That histogram is now the sampling distribution. And if you want to be uh, in the context of our fishing trip uh, here, this was our simulated by computer, our 2,500 days of fishing. And the sampling distributions for the intercept and the slope are shown in this picture right here. So he, uh, in this picture labeled beta naught, uh, we have the sampling distribution of the intercept. And in this picture labeled beta 1 in the bottom panel, we have the sampling distribution of the slope. Okay, uh, And if you want to actually talk about some kind of number here, uh, the obvious number would be to maybe calculate a standard deviation of this number, right? Uh, of this sampling distribution right here. So if you calculate the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, we call that the standard error. It's the standard error. And in this case, this would be the standard error of the slope because we're talking about this, this sampling distribution of beta 1. So again, just to be super, super specific here, if we go back up to this picture, this histogram right here, represents a histogram of the slopes of all 1,000 of these different regression lines right here. Or I guess there's 2,500, not 1,000. Okay, And then this, this top one right here, this represents the sampling distribution of all 2,500 intercepts from that picture above. So those are our sampling distributions, and we would naturally summarize them, how variable they are, using the standard deviation, just like we would do for any histogram. And we just have this specific vocabulary word, the standard error, for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Now, if we go back to this schematic over here, and I kind of made this picture ugly, so let me do a little bit of erasing right here. If we come back to this schematic over here, uh, something may occur to you, which is that you know this is super unrealistic, right? I mean, under what circumstances? You, you know, you've got some data set. Under what circumstances uh, are you ever going to then go collect 999 more data sets for the sole purpose of understanding how certain you can be about the estimate from your particular sample, right? So this is just hopelessly unrealistic. You're never going to go actually out into the real world and recollect one sample over, uh, over another to actually form this histogram right down here, okay? Uh, and so it seems like this, this thought experiment that, it, while nice, right, you kind of get a sense of, of a, a wider sampling distribution reflecting greater uncertainty about a parameter, it doesn't make a, a lot of difference in the real world because it just is a very, very impractical recipe for going and do this. Uh, and that is where the idea of the bootstrap comes in. Okay, And, and the bootstrap specifically is called a resampling-based technique. Uh, the main idea is that by pretending that the sample itself is the population, we can approximate the effect of sampling variability by taking one sample after another from the sample itself. Okay, so there's a, this turns out to be a specific, very realistic, uh, and very uh, widely useful way of approximating a sampling distribution, uh, and that's what we'll turn to in the next video.